Uh, I can't think of anybody better to continue this discussion than uh, the leader of the uh, Office of the National Coordinator and the Acting Assistant Secretary for Health in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I'm very pleased to welcome Karen DeSalvo uh, this morning. Uh, just a brief background on Karen. I think you all know her pretty well. She's uh, focused her career on improving access to affordable, high-quality care for all people, especially vulnerable populations. That's actually how I I got to know her first when she was working in New Orleans in the Katrina setting and as health commissioner for the city of New Orleans and senior health uh, policy advisor for the, the mayor of New Orleans and also very involved through Tulane in activities in the community uh, as well. She went on from that uh, to the job at ONC and to uh, being the acting assistant secretary for health, including uh, uh, a range of challenging issues on top of all the health IT challenges like uh, uh, dealing with uh, the, the Ebola outbreak this past year. Uh, so I think you all know that history. Actually, uh, what many of you probably don't know is the first time I, I met uh, uh, Karen, I think, was back in high school. We're both uh, Austin <laughs> High graduates, so it is a small world. And Karen, we're really glad to have you here with us today. Thank you, Mark. I, I, I told this story about Mark before. He was very fancy in high school, and he didn't even know who I was. But he's, ki he's kind to pretend that he, that, he, that he would have acknowledged me in the hallways. <laughs> he's still fancy. Thank you all for um, uh, have, having me here today. What I plan to do is make some remarks and then have some time for questions for, for you all towards the end. Um, I, I think Mark's going to moderate that for us. Um, I just want to uh, begin, first of all, by acknowledging my predecessors who are here today, uh, da David Brailer and Farzad Mustashari, who's already tweeting uh, in, in the corner over there. Uh, I, I didn't have a chance to hear your panel, but I had someone listening in, and I heard it was great, as always. Um, I, I, this is important for me to, to acknowledge that the work that we are doing at ONC builds upon a decade of effort, not only by the national coordinators and the teams at ONC, but by the broader community, many of which you have been all, all been a part of for some time. And it's been an amazing decade. We have really accomplished quite a bit with, the, with respect to digitizing the care experience for this country. Back 10 years ago, when Brailler was in office and was describing the, the need to connect care for the nation, and that we would need to collect or digitize the care experience, but see that it could move across that care continuum so could, could it be so it could be put to use. This work um, was supported by efforts at ONC around driving advancement in the federal space and with states, but certainly took off with the passage of the High Tech Act and the opportunity to make a significant investment on the front lines for care to see that we could offset the cost of adoption of electronic health records in the care environment for meaningful use eligible providers. So this means uh, the opportunity, what we have now spent about $28 billion to see that we can uh, help providers to uh, adopt and adapt to their practice environment, one in which they're no longer going to use paper but going to include in the, the care experience a digitization of the patient's uh, medical needs of the patient's medical experience and have that available to them on return to enhance continuity and enhance the quality of care and decision making for the patients and the doctors and the hospitals beyond. Uh, as you also know, uh, part of the growth in high tech was the development of ONC's portfolio of resources that are, does include the certification program, but also an opportunity through the standards and interoperability framework to set a table to have a dialogue with the private sector and others around how we could develop standards that would advance the, the healthcare collection of data and, frankly, beyond even already. In addition, um, as I'm sure you're aware, we have been able to support and advance research to try to understand the safety and quality implications of electronic health records and health information technology and see how we could use our resources to connect on the front lines with providers through programs like our Regional Extension Center program and efforts to, con to connect with consumers through Blue Button such that the ecosystem would be broader than just hospitals and doctors, but we would really be uh, bringing everyone to table and reach as far down to the ground as we could so we would not leave anyone behind, that being the policy goal, uh, to see that everyone in this country had access to their electronic health information, that uh, every physician and hospital had the opportunity to have that information uh, available uh, at their fingertips. 
And so here we are um, today in the midst of this meaningful use program. We are in stage two at this point. The data thus far continues to show that hospitals are uh, adopting and adapting very well. Uh, we know that uh, it appears that 90% of hospitals are meeting stage two, or at least are testing. Some of them are still choosing stage one based upon some flexibility options that we offered in the last few months based upon product availability and just the ability to optimize the, the, the products in practice. We're in the midst of physician and, and eligible professional uh, attestation to meaningful use stage two, knowing that um, optimization of the products on the front line uh, seems to be a challenge for some providers. And again, the policy goal of this being an everyone in opportunity, I offered some additional flexibility recently with timeline and have really been thinking quite a bit uh, inside of HHS and with our partners about what does the next chapter of meaningful use look like. Again, uh, thinking about this goal of uh, the, the every American having an electronic health record of that uh, information being available, not just uh, for big systems or big cities, but uh, really reaching into all of America as we have. And so that means as we're thinking about stage three, making sure we're incorporating lessons learned from the last few years uh, and considering what our priorities are going forward. So how do we be as, as straightforward and flexible and outcomes focused and really attend to interoperability as we continue on this uh, journey with meaningful use. All of that has been really a tremendous success, and I, I say this often, and I hope that you hear it. This is not about what ONC did or CMS did. This is about what doctors on the front line did or hospital administrators and what consumers are doing to pull data. This has been a heavy lift for everyone in the country, and we're not done. We're not done for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is that meaningful use as a program for all that it has done that is great is only a subset of providers. Um, one of our FACA members had a great way of expressing this. She said, the glass is half full, but when you step back, you realize it's a pretty small glass. And that's Gail Harrell on our FACA, and she's right. Uh, no matter how great that data looks in the space of MU, if you really wanted to, to tell the story of somebody's care experience or even health experience. We're only a part of the way there. We haven't been able yet to incorporate data from the behavioral health system or where the long-term post-acute care environment on discharge. Yes, there are pockets of success. Yes, there are models we want to follow. But systematically, in the way we've done it for the meaningful use providers, we just haven't completed that whole picture. In addition, in the last few years especially, the health IT ecosystem has dramatically evolved in such a way that the world is moving away from uh, an, an electronic health record, an institutionally centric model of data to one that is person-centered. I understand that was discussed some this morning, and I'm so happy to hear it because it is absolutely what I hear when I go out and do listening sessions across the country. I've had the chance to do some 15 sessions in a variety of, of communities across the, the country in the last year since I've been national coordinator, and it can range from what you hear in Mobile, Alabama, where um, they're still sorting out how to adopt electronic health records, how to get through the clunkiness of the systems that they have selected and chosen, how they're going to transition from one to another if they've decided that they want to evolve to a new electronic health record, to what's happening in places like Minnesota, where they're considering the holistic approach and the public health and how they're going to incorporate data that really wraps not just around a person, but a community, to Silicon Valley where they don't even understand that there still is an electronic health record, and they think that <laughs> there are just digital platforms that paint a picture of small, big, and large and long data for people and communities that has endless possibilities for the entrepreneurial community. And all in between. Uh, it is a story that, that when, I, when I bring it home and we, we think about this as a policy team at HHS, we are remembering that the world of health IT is moving very quickly, our responsibility is to protect the average person, the people in this country, to protect their data, protect their ability to have access to that information, to support that environment from a regulatory standpoint, but not to be in the way. We want to allow the innovation to occur. What we also hear and what we also know is that health IT is, by and large, a means to an end. It is a lot of fun, and it's a career for many people. But the reason we do this is because it's an enabler. It's a way that we make care better, more fun, more accessible, more convenient. It's a way that we get information into the hands of every person so that they can truly be engaged and be empowered in the experience of not only their care, but of improving their health. 
And so as we are thinking about the application of all the tools and technology and the work that, that we have been doing, we're always thinking about how is it going to fit into the bigger picture of what people really want to have happen every day. People, when we do community listening sessions, very rarely talk about the health IT. It's about the data. It's about the thing that comes on the other side. It's about the fact that the data is locked. It's about the, the fact that it is not there when and where it matters, whether it's to you as a person or to you as a healthcare system or to you as a doctor or a nurse. And so unlocking that has become a central focus of our work in the last year to figure out how we get to interoperability. How do we move data from ca being captured in the silos where it has been by and large and push it into the broader ecosystem? We are very lucky because the world at large is ready for that to happen. The environment has changed such that the right drivers seem to be lining up to push the data out or to be to need the, to have it need to be pulled in to ex, to be accessed that environment is being dramatically enabled by work that secretary burwell has charged us with at hhs to move the delivery system from one that is um, more focused on volume not as accessible and convenient and somewhat uh, data poor with respect to the availability of information to make good decisions that work around improving the care system uh, seeing that we get better care, smarter spending, and healthier people lines up in really three major pathways, critical pathways we call them, ways that we believe at HHS that we can help advance the health care ecosystem in such a way that it's going to meet the expectations of people and really serve their needs better. The three pathways are changing the way we pay for care, changing the way care is delivered, and finally seeing that the information is available to make better decisions for everybody on the ground. The incentive piece has gotten a lot of attention, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, but I'm going to say it hopefully four times if I remember today. Uh, on behalf of the secretary and of the team that has been working on this, that we uh, don't believe that you can only change the incentives. You must also either support innovation and in care delivery or step out of the way if the innovation is happening and find ways to support it. And all of this cannot flourish and be and, and be successful unless the information is easier to access uh, and unless we can really facilitate and enable quality measurement for a set of measures that matter and that are parsimonious and purposeful and all the other things the IOM is saying. So those, these three critical elements must happen together, but the incentive piece happens uh, for us in such a way that it really is going to help drive the interoperability. Um, it, it, the, the major goal that we announced on uh, January 23rd was that by, um, or maybe it was the 26th, January, by uh, 2018, we would, we, Medicare, have 50% of our payments in alternative payment models. So we would see that we were moving uh, in, a, in a forward motion with a very clear date certain to get us out of a predominant model of paying for doing more to one in which we were paying for doing better. This would mean um, sometimes still in a fee-for-service, what we call chassis in insurance, but but some risk sharing, some population focus, and ultimately to really a more population level set of payment. In addition, uh, all other payments would be linked to quality in such a way that we would know if care was better, not just if it was delivered. We have asked, and they have said yes, for private payers um, to come along. There are an increasing number of Medicaid programs that have said yes, this is the direction we want to go. Thank you for, for setting the 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 goal out into the public domain. We want to work with you on some shared goals. That is all going to um, unfold through a learning and action network, the first meeting of which is March 25th. And it is um, there's some more information available on our website. It is designed to invite everybody in. Uh, not everybody will fit in a room, so some people are going to have to watch. But, um, but we really do need everybody to be thinking about how together we're going to advance um, this alternative payment model and, what we, and how we're going to define things like quality and risk adjustment and attribution, some of the nuances. The second uh, piece of this is around care delivery. We announced um, a few months ago an $800 million investment in the, tran the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative through CMMI to support providers on the front line uh, to provide technical assistance as people evolve to alternative payment models and adapt and innovate their practice. 
that is one of many tools that we have in our toolbox to help support that. We want to help states through their Medicaid programs. We want to help providers through, pro through efforts that SAMHSA and HRSA do. So we are lining up all those levers to see that, again, no one gets left behind, that this is really about an opportunity for everyone to have the kind of care that they want. And finally, information. A better business model and a better care model is going to require a better data model. That data model um, is going to uh, really involve not only the unlocking of electronic health record information and the continued adoption across the continuum, but pushing the information out into the marketplace so there's more transparency about cost and quality so you can make better decisions, so you understand what you're purchasing. Um, to, and then finally, to enhance shared decision making and, um, and independent decision making, whether that's for clinicians uh, or consumers. I want to just end uh, with a few words about the interoperability piece because currently that is the, the, the big effort that we have pushed out and it is the piece that I think has a lot of promise to practically advance the work that we've already done as a community for the past decade and pull us in a direction that uh, is going to require and expect adoption not just in the healthcare space but think about how other technologies and data becomes incorporated into a person-centered model of information that really paints a picture of your health, the person's health, my health, not just my healthcare experience. Uh, in essence, uh, uh, we like things in threes in HHS. Have you all noticed that? Because I'm about to give you three again. Um, for interoperability after uh, not only listening sessions in the community, but countless conversations with our FACAs, with others, um, through um, work that we did with contractors, with feedback that we received after we put out on a wiki page and asked for all 318 million Americans to give us feedback about some initial ideas that we had. Um, and now we're back out in public comment. And here's where we settled on what we think the critical path items are to get to interoperability. The first is we need to standardize the standards. This is, um, a time in health IT when we have let a thousand flowers bloom, we have learned a great deal about what works, what works better, and how, um, how, how things can sometimes be uh, cumbersome if the systems aren't using the same basic dictionary, the same alphabet, call it what you want, the same basic set of standards. Uh, in addition, uh, what we have proposed in our interoperability standards advisory is not just a list of standards, but what we, what we believe is a list of uh, standards that are limited enough and focused enough that it gets you a minimum clinical data set, healthcare focused, I get it, but the beginnings of, of stringing together the healthcare system such that uh, we, can, we can have that information there before the patient, I read somewhere yesterday, the electron, electrons arrive before the person does, or if it's being sought, um, that information can be pulled by the clinician or by the patient themselves. That is the getting everybody to use the same set of standards so we're not quibbling over that. Then we can have lots of opportunity to innovate, innovate in the other attributes of electronic health records and um, other parts of the health IT ecosystem. The second is about incentives to use those standards and to use a set of business practices that make sense for folks. This is where linking all this back to the delivery system reform is so important as we advance payment models at HHS as Medicaid does, as the private sector does, we want to align those things in such a way that there's an expectation that data is being pushed and pulled and moved in the community with patient consent and in such a way that it can paint that picture of them there, the small data, it be aggregated for big data purposes, whether for payment or community health, and also paint a long picture of the person's health. The final area is um, around trust. And the trust piece has to do with um, knowing knowing who is going to receive the data on the other end and feeling comfortable that they're going to, they're going to use that information, that, that data in such a way that is respectful not only of the, the person whose data it is, but of you as a provider, um, a doctor in that example. If they're going to do analytics on it, understanding that they have the context right, et cetera. It also it has to do with privacy. It has to do with security. It has to do with funding of the infrastructure to move data around. These are questions that we uh, call out in the interoperability roadmap, and I just want to give you a really high-level frame about this, and then, and then I'll sort of talk about where we're going with it. One is um, we have got to move away from thinking about uh, the health information exchange and interoperability infrastructure in the country as being one in which electronic health records or health systems talk to each other. That is an older model. The model that we've got to plan for is one in which there are other actors in the ecosystem. That is such a wonky thing to say. 
but it's the easiest way to say it. And I, I just left ASTO, the public health folks, right? And we were having this very same conversation. Public health has a, a responsibility and a, a set of needs around surveillance as an example, and they, they have to be a part of the set of, of, of discussions and governance and access to data where appropriate to help advance the public's health. Consumers um, need to be a part of the conversation and not just have a voice, but, but also have a vote, just to, to call out two that I don't think are adequately at the table. We have laid out a set of rules of the road. Um, we are working with states on privacy law alignment because we hear from them that that is a significant early barrier, and we will be um, bringing together some of the key players in interoperability space to lay out what needs to happen by when, just as we are also looking at how we can set uh, rules of the road for interoperability that are more discrete and defined and where necessary that we might actually be able to identify entities that are following a set of guidelines and, and have where necessary some repercussions for folks that are bad actors and not playing well in the marketplace. This is heavy work for us in 2015, us not ONC, but us the community. And um, if it weren't that we were pushing ourselves enough, I can promise you the White House is pushing us hard because the VA and the DOD and um, the private sector really need to talk. And we, uh, ONC, are, are shepherding that conversation with them as well. So there's a lot of pressure from inside of the US government to make this happen. I feel a lot of pull from consumers for their data to be free. And we should not ignore that because this is what they expect of us. It is what they have in every other sector of their life. It is what we have, have to offer them. And all we need to do is simply <laughs> solve those three critical path issues uh, and, and work with you all to get there. So my final comment is just this. Um, it's out for public comment. Uh, this is what we have laid out as, as 166 painful pages of, of uh, the, the best practices and best thinking that we have uh, identified in the country. We know that uh, it is not where we want the world to be in five years in a more restful state that is as, as usable and flexible as, as we're all hoping it'll start to get to be. But on the other hand, the responsibility, the push, the need, the drive is today to connect what we have done, to say that this investment that we have made in this country and the digitization of the care experience is going to come to fruition in such a way that it's going to make your care feel different when you arrive, and then it's going to make decisions that much easier, and it's going to enable us to get to a place where this healthcare system broadly is working in the way that we all want it to. I'm going to stop there, and I'll be delighted to take any questions. Thank you all. We're going to sit down for these questions. There are, there are microphones on the um, side there, and I think we'll get a little bit of help uh, in doing that. So uh, while Karen's getting properly mic'd for the, the questions, um, just wanted to highlight that, as you emphasize in your remarks, Karen, there's a lot that the Office of the National Coordinator does um, in terms of technical assistance, in terms of helping identify and promote best practices, really in terms of coordinating. It's a lot, it's a, it's a lot to coordinate. But um, I did want to start out with uh, a couple of the, the policies that, that ONC is most associated with that, that you spent some time on uh, now, where there are new things happening. One of those is the meaningful use payment systems, and the other is the interoperability roadmap. Uh, in terms of meaningful use, you, you laid out this um, very uh, uh, broad vision, but one that has some pretty short-term um, actions needed to get to changes in payment. You know, the, the value-based payments, 50% uh, of, uh, uh, of the Medicare payment systems by 2018, value elements in, in all of the, uh, the rest of the fee-for-service payments, too. What it, can, can you talk a little bit more about what that means for Meaningful Use Stage 3? I mean, we, we've talked this morning about how Meaningful Use Stage 3 is about uh, getting more of a focus on uh, on outcomes and results, but as you said, that means needing good quality measures that reflect outcomes that matter, and in turn, from an IT standpoint, being able to produce the, the, the data elements for those in a way that's not terribly burdensome for providers. And this seems, seems like a pretty short time frame to get from where we are with Meaningful Use Stage 2 to really supporting that kind of vision in just a few years. So I wonder if you can say a little bit more about what is going to happen uh, with Meaningful Use payments to get from Stage 2 to Stage 3 and really deliver on that, uh, that, that goal. 
It's a little bit like having a, a baby, and you can't really talk about exactly what you're having, <laughs> which, what gender it is. But you can. Yeah, um, so we are in the in the midst of, of rulemaking on meaningful use stage three. So there's not a whole lot I can say, but I, let, let me go. Let me just sort of go back to some of the general uh, philosophical and, and the principle based approach, and then um, talk talk about uh, advancing towards interoperability. Um, you know uh, the the products, the the developer products that we have uh, adopted. There there are many of them. They have in many ways had a set of standards that are their own and, and aren't necessarily shared uh, across. And so it's it's causing some some needing to build bridges, interfaces in the marketplace. Um, there's been a lot. There were a lot of expectations on on pro, on providers using that term globally to mean hospitals and, and, and professionals and others. And some clearly some folks can need it. Uh, they, they, they're clearly that people are, um, in whatever way, uh, achieving the expectations of meaningful use stage two. On the other hand, um, there, there it was, it's clear that in some cases the uh, operationalization of some of the technology and some of the, the practices on the ground was, was a challenge. And um, so for whatever reasons, uh, we were seeing in early data a year ago that it, look, it looked as though we might have a, a digital divide. We might get into a situation where we had um, communities, um, s small practices, rural hospitals as examples that would get left behind. And that, of course, as I said, is not the policy goal. The policy goal is that, um, is that this is uh, for everybody's experience. Uh, it, it's also true that um, we have learned a lot in the last few years at HHS about how we need to do a better job of harmonizing our quality measures. And, and so that, uh, my husband always talks about click boxes, and, he, and, and as does everybody. I mean, I still practice, and I know I just don't have as many because mostly what I do is you know, sort of urgent care stuff. But it's, it's, um, it's a lot, um, and, and there are a lot of reasons why there's so many click boxes. So thinking about the measures that really matter, how do we align those in a macro fashion so that at least there's not hundreds uh, across not just the, the HHS programs, but if you add in private payers and Medicaid and others, to, 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 and Patrick Conway and his team are to be, uh, I think, applauded. Uh, he's been very serious about this and really wants to continue to advance and focus, 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 focus is kind of what I'm trying to say. Like there's it's lots of things that you can have, but at some point we have to cut the, we just have to say we can't do everything, we can't be everything to everyone unless we get uh, really, really uh, intently focused on where we're going. Because the next piece that you're, that you're talking about is not just measures and um, interoperability of documents or exchange of information, it's really about the integration of data, it's about 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 uh, the abstraction of, of data points that as a usual part of workflow. If we really want to bring value-based payment to scale, if we really want to see that we are able to do population-level measurement to understand how, how our health system is managing an entire population, that cannot be done chart by chart by chart by hand. It just can't. It has got to be uh, uh, something that we can pull out of the EHR in such a way that, that, that it's almost seamless. And, and you could add in maintenance certification, quality improvement, lots of other reasons. So you, then you sort of, so this is the questions that we asked ourselves. And we said, so then what is the, what is the holdup? Well, it's, it's measurement, not measures. It's, those are two issues. And if you want to do measurement, let's get, again, focused on what is the basic set of things. It's, it's the minimum clinical data set is what we're calling it. You guys got to pay attention to that in the roadmap and in the standards advisory. We really need you to be thinking about the use cases for that. There's a collect once, use multiple times. We are trying very hard to start with that foundation. We know that we will need to build from there. I know that I cannot, excuse me, get to the, the level of precision that Francis Collin wants for precision medicine with the beginnings of measuring blood pressure in this way, but it is the beginning. And then, we, and then we will build up from there. So I think that, that it, this is about focusing on what we can leave at the door, but what we can capture now, doing it in a way that's electronic so there's not added work for folks, so that we can bring it all to scale in the way that we need And that is what the interoperability roadmap is, is mainly all about. And you, you emphasized earlier that uh, this is intended to be you know, a way to get from where we are now to this ideal state down the road. It's not going to be easy. That's something that came up in the discussions this morning and um, wanted to just follow up a little bit on the, the uh, approaches that you've emphasized. So you talk about standardizing the standards and, and I, it sounds like that's really starting with this minimum data set, these critical data elements. And it, it, have you... Uh, and, and, and there's another set of you know, implementation specifications. There's some additional right. things on the 
standards advisor. Right, and then making those, uh, you maybe comment a little on um, how is, is there going to be with this process some um, uh, payoff that providers and patients can see. I mean, that's what you, you emphasize that in your in your remarks too. Is there a lot of uh, um, people out there now who are you know are implementing compliant medical records, um, but still facing some burdens and in terms of data reentry for payment or other things, uh, maybe for measurement, for quality measurement, um, is the, or do you think these minimum data set steps are, are going to really help line up that business case and, and help, uh, you know, not just a use case, but a business case, the cost, people are going to see cost going down or, or quality going up, you know, some, uh, some real benefits in the, the short to medium term. I'm not trying to put you on the spot too much, but uh, this has uh, been, been, been a part of the theme uh, today. The, um, so, okay, let me, let me start by saying, um, reminding folks um, like Robert uh, that we pulled a, pa a page out of the playbook from the last administration in publishing a list of standards. And, um, and pointing to them with a set of mandates and incentives. This is um, something that when we got, had the Meaningful Use Program, it was such a, a big program with so much money that we used a certification um, pathway as the way to point to the, the set of standards. So this is um, um, really borrowing some of the, is that when I said we look at best practices and borrowed some of the best of the best, we even looked at our own, reflected back in our own history. I mentioned that because when, when that was done, that set of, that set of standards was pointed to not with a, there was no meaningful use program but there was there were procurement programs VA DOD there were a set of standards that they used um, there were um, a payment programs through Medicaid and Medicare state level programs that began to, to point to a list of standards and we do have um, the opportunity at ONC to expect that VA and DOD as an example will use those standards when they procure and, and use information. And in fact, the DOD has been very public about this. They're saying that they will purchase one of the gates, the, the stop gates is a ONC certified product as part of their advancement of their EHR system. And beyond that, as they're looking at health IT that they're going to need, they have uh, pointed to our set of standards as this is the, this is the place that they'll want to go to make certain that we're adhering to that and um, VA as, as well. Um, we'll point to the standards, and I want to just make another point about the, those because we deliberately did this in a sub-regulatory fashion for a host of reasons, but one of which is that standards move quickly, um, regulatory process sometimes not so much. This is um, something that we want to make sure we don't get stuck in um, a set of standards that are not keeping up with the pace. So let's say, for example, the hype curve stays where it is and fire matures and the Argonauts fulfill their promise in just a couple of months and we have... Um, Everybody we, understands we what have, that means. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know what that is? I'm sorry. So, um, so there, there, um, you know, there's, there's this sort of thing that, that we're using a set of standards that are really good, but they're rather complicated and, and, and expensive, et cetera. There's a new standard called FHIR, F -H -I -R, if you don't know about it and you want to read about it, that is open source. It's being um, matured in the, through the processes. And, and this is what's really exciting about where I think the world's gone in the last year since I've been mostly paying attention is that providers and, um, and vendors have come to the table together, even competitors, and said, we're going to work together in such a way that we, we realize that we have to have a shared set of standards. We cannot keep working in different ways, and we have to open, our, open the data up. We have to unlock it. And so technology, your standards are like fire, are a way that we can do that. But it's best done if they do this together rather than if we just say, this is what it is and impose it. We, really, we need the people doing it every day and experimenting with it in, in the real world, in the clinical environment, to think about the use cases, what's really going to matter to the people that they're there to serve, to, to, to make it real and applied in, in the real world. And so I'm putting pressure on some people in the room who are part of that process because um, I, I, I really, it, it's exciting to me that they have found a table, they're working collaboratively. We really want to support and encourage that and, and, and do, do see that that allows the standards to evolve. So sub-regulatory on purpose because we want to make sure we can evolve, but, but please make no mistake, it's not, a, it's not a just a, hey, this is a nice list because the federal partners need to have a list and if nothing else, our, our folks that are purchasing care or purchasing systems um, or setting standards, need to, we, we all need to be on the same page because we have to be able to 
have that information moved. It was a great discussion. I want to see if there are oh, any. I'm over time. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we'll, do you have a couple more minutes? or? I think so. I don't know. People are in charge of me. Uh, ask. Uh, I think, okay. Um, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, microphone coming. Thanks very much, Dr. DeSalvo. My, my question is about the um, moving from meaningful use to payment for value. And John Graham from National Center for Policy Analysis. What, when I talk to entrepreneurs and stuff, you know, like telemedicine folks especially, that, you know, they, they talk a good game, but really they want to get in the coding system effectively. They want a modifier or whatever. I mean, what is the risk that instead of going for value, they just get stuck into the same old coding system and get into evaluation and management codes or stuff like that? Is that a risk that you folks at CMS perceive or, or not? Maybe I'm off base. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I understand all the question, but I'm going to try to answer it. And if I mess up, then you can, you can redirect me. Uh, I, there are a lot of potential pitfalls as we move to value-based payment. The first is defining what it is. What, what does that mean? And I, I would point those of you who are interested to a paper that um, Dr. Conway um, and, and some of his team published in, in JAMA um, that, that talks about four categories of payment. And not that it's an evolution from one end, it's not a continuum, there's just four categories. So be clear about that. We could skip over value-based payments that are linked to fee-for-service and just go to, um, to a, a more of a population level payment. The reason um, that we, we think that in general, the further you get away from the fee-for-service chassis of payment, that, that e &M code system is, is that you allow uh, more flexibility to happen in the system and there's data to support that. There's plenty of demonstration projects uh, around the country in the private and the public sector that show that when you pay on a population level, uh, people tend to work at the top of their license. They work in teams. There's um, an encouragement towards home-based care, telehealth, other uh, assets that really make care more convenient and coordinated. And patients are happier, doctors are happier, and the quality improves. So building upon what we have learned, we want to—that's that's an example of where payment can kind of get out of the way. The, 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 the devil's in the details. How do you know that you're, you're that even if you do shared measures, how do you know that that patient belongs to that system? Um, how do you, and, and I'm sorry I keep using the word patient, but this is about healthcare payment. Um, how do you know that um, you have measured the right things um, and that you've risk adjusted properly and not inadvertently allowed for worse care to be delivered to populations who are more vulnerable as an example? So there's a lot of, of, of technical detail that will have to be, have to be worked out. But I don't want to lose sight of one other thing that, about the fee-for-service, which does nag at us a little bit. And that is that we do have, because this is part of your question, there's a whole industry around the legacy systems for insurance in this country and the migration of that. We think EHR, paper to EHR was a challenge and EHR to interoperability. But this is a, a really major back office challenge that we um, don't have a perfect solution for, but it's, it's something that Certainly CMS, and I'll, I'll, Andy Flavitt really in tune to this, that he needs to figure out how he can help everybody move to a new model. Oh, great question. Uh, we, we are about out of time now. I want to thank Karen for a, a great discussion of current initiatives, coming initiatives, uh, and uh, giving us a sense of where things are going. We're looking forward to those meaningful use uh, uh, stage three, phase three uh, uh, regulations. But uh, Karen, thanks so much for taking the time today and doing something that's really difficult, which is making me sound like I was cool in high school. Thank you all very much. <laughs>